Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars and guys who impress. A couple of weeks ago, I was delighted to be invited to go and see Miss Saigon in London. And one man really stuck out as a huge star. That's Hugh Maynard. How are you, Hugh? I'm well, thank you, Alex. Thank you for calling. Oh, my pleasure. I'm calling you on two things, really. One, to talk to you about Miss Saigon, which was extraordinary. And Sunday, 17th of August in Leicester Square at the Leicester Square Theatre, Hugh will be singing Bredoy uh, for the Philippine Dream Charity gala concert to raise funds for abandoned children in Manila. You're going to be singing your big song, Bredoy. Let's start with that then. How much does that song take out of you? Because it's quite an 11 o'clock number, isn't it? It really is. I mean, it's not something you can sing several times a day. So luckily, uh, the event is on a Sunday, my rest day. Um, but it's for a great cause. It's for, to help build a theatre in the Philippines uh, for these young children and just allow them you know, allow the kids just to be kids. There's nothing, uh, we're not asking anything uh, uh, from the people coming to watch the show other to just enjoy themselves and uh, get lost in the music on the day, on the night. It's going to be happening on Sunday night. We'll give all the details as to where and how you can get tickets in a minute. Firstly, though, about you. What a voice and what a talent. I mean, I say this to all the greats. You can't really be trained to sing like that. That was something you were blessed with, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, first of all. But um, yeah, I, um, I have to kind of agree. I've not had singing lessons. Um, I've had voice classes, speech classes. Uh, but when it came to singing um, through my formal education, um, I was told that I was too old to learn to sing. So actually that's given me freedom to express myself through music without being having the constraints of being told, oh, you're a tenor, oh, you're a baritone, oh, you can only sing certain types of music. Now I have that freedom to sing what I feel, truly. What you have is soul. I mean, there's just such warmth to your voice and you can't buy that. You sing the number which is really the most poignant. Bredoy, of course, is about the children. It's incredibly emotional. How do you balance that thing between giving it emotion and losing it halfway through? Um, well, I have a very good boss, first of all, you know, Cameron McIntosh. Um, he's given me the freedom in Bredoy to give it that soulful, gospel-esque, um, expression and literally uh, b- before the first preview I was about to sing Cameron McIntosh came up to me and he said I want you to riff I, I had to pat him on the shoulder and go back to him and say sorry Cameron did you say riff as in um, R-I-F-F as in make up words as in ad lib I've never heard Cameron speak like this before he said Hugh I want you to take it someplace it's never been taken before and if I don't like it <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll resend it and literally, Cameron gave me that permission to take that song to another place, and that's what I do every single night. So when you come to see Boy on a Monday, it would be different to the Boy on a Thursday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Wow. Seems to me Cameron in this production has just enjoyed himself hiring people he wanted to hire and allowed them to be who they are. I don't think there's ever been a production, and by the way, I call this the greatest musical in British history. I believe it to be that. I don't think there's been, ever been a show with so many talented people who are able to shine, has there? I think Cameron, that is Cameron's gift. Um, yes, he may be a multi-millionaire. Yes, he's a very well-known producer. But at heart, Cameron is a people person. He's very good at attracting personalities. And also his talent is bringing out whatever gifts or talents or traits that you have as a person. And, um, and we all feel, and John John included, we all feel very comfortable working with Cameron, who's also very much involved in the process of the casting, in the process of producing, and sometimes um, on stage, as much as he tries to stay away, you'll always see him in the stalls. Uh, or in the auditorium <laughs> keeping an eye on his baby which is Miss Saigon I don't blame him I mean it's a huge beast and it really is an incredible show and still doing massive massive business I think it does prove if you put something on in the West End that's good they will come I think there's been an arrogance lately hasn't there that people think they can come in spend 7 million throw it at a show and hope that it'll work the West End's not as predictable as that is it? Um, it's not about money and um, I don't want to seem arrogant because I I know the production that you're talking about and um, you know on, on an actor's level you've also got stage management uh, crew lighting sound LX you know there's so many different departments uh, that you don't always hear about um, but it puts people's livelihoods at risk when you become arrogant you really do have to put the, 
gravity, the foundation into a production. You can't just throw money at something and hope that it will work. So Cameron really does have the ingredients, the experience, and the creative team around him to put on such a spectacular that even Miss Saigon. I've seen you in various shows over the years. I mean, you've done them all from The Lion King. Um, most recently, I saw you in Sister Act. You did Dancing in the Streets, where I know that was a show you got to shine. Um, is there any greater thrill when the phone rings and they go, OK, we've auditioned a thousand people and you're it. And then how do you cope with the pressure of it that you've got to deliver eight times a week? Well, that's it, because uh, um, first of all, you can hear I'm laughing because you think about, wow, really? There were, there were that many people up for the role of John? Um, because there, there's always self-doubt. You know, we are just human. You know, no matter what you know what your capacity is, um, what vocation you work in, um, I feel honoured. I, I think to myself, really, I've got the job. Really, you, you want me? Are you sure? Uh, have, you got, have you got the right number? Um, so, so every night, again, it's about giving, 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 and the more you give in this. Uh, piece, Miss Saigon, the more you get back. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about it because there is so much that you can keep giving. You're literally shot out of a cannon when that curtain goes up for the second time after the interval. What's going through your head while we're all enjoying an overpriced glass of wine? Well, you're very lucky because I wish I could join you with the wine. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't actually get an interval because in the new production, Lawrence O'Connor, great director by the way, has... Um, given the principles um, or put the principles in the city of the exodus so um, I'm actually second in line um, to exit or enter an exit the stage but what you don't see is me literally giving it um, the same bolt under the stage up to the third floor of the theatre to be fitted with my um, my, my wig essentially yeah. then into my widowed costume uh, the world's quickest uh, voice check then onto the stage literally silence uh, at the top of Act 2 wow. so it's a bit of a it's a it's a literally um, a race uh, so there's not much thinking time going on but, um, but my preparation goes on literally from the telephone song in Act 1 the first half an hour of the show um, up until the top of Act 2 so I'm literally preparing myself all that time for we joy and it is really one of those moments where it's all about you. How thrilling is it when you look out at that sellout crowd, which it is most nights, and the band are playing for you, and you've, of course, got that choir behind you who are just making you shine even more. Is there any way of describing that feeling? Um, well, yes, there's euphoria. But um, again, I'm very fortunate because what I can do, I can have eye contact with the guys uh, to my left and to my right. Audience-wise, I can only see the first few rows and so I don't feel like I'm out there on my own I really do feel like I have the support uh, we call them chorus and ensemble but literally they are my partners and my backbone uh, whilst I'm on stage and technically but well, essentially I'm their voice also so I'm really feeling um, that even though you only hear one person singing it's uh, you know it's 42 voices in one I've been reading your CV and I mentioned earlier you were in The Lion King. I have a dream. I don't know if you know about this, Hugh, but I've always wanted to be a giraffe in The Lion King. I think it's a, I think it's the future of my career. Um, what was it like being in that show? Because, I mean, it is splendid, isn't it? Um, it was incredible. I just finished uh, doing Jesus Christ Superstar for Andrew Lloyd Webber, which was my first job fresh out of college. And, um, in fact, I uh, pulled out of college early to do Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, I finished, let me see, Superstar on a Saturday, on the Wednesday, I was in New York. Wow. And um, so um, Disney had taken um, or invited some of the, the principals over to the States to see the show because you couldn't actually explain what The Lion King was about, how we were going to take it from a cartoon feature yeah. um, into a stage production. So I was one of the uh, very fortunate people to go and see The Lion King in New York. Um, these pictures brought my headdress, in fact, two headdresses which were made from a carbon fiber, you know, the same material as an airplane wing. And uh, met Julie Taymor, uh, went out with Labby, um, sorry, Lebo M, sorry, Labby Sisbury, Lebo M. Yeah. And then literally within three days, back to the UK, came with rehearsal, and it was literally being, like being in, in, in Disneyland, you know, money for Disney at that time, I should say. Um, it wasn't about the expense, it was about the experience, about the ride, and literally they made us feel very, very comfortable, very supportive, and we were trying so many new things, so many kind of, um, I mean, puppetry, for example, I've never done puppetry, 
um, a lot of the moves that we do on stage with Simba when he bows it's very Malaysian Indonesian in its um, in, in its essence and so it was an incredible journey a great experience and I show, a show that I did for nearly two years and it is still beautiful it's amazing that some almost 15 years on isn't it since it happened on Broadway it's still as relevant and as beautiful today as it was then it really is and I have to add it's one of my so far best entries onto a stage uh, when Simba sings a Kuna Matata he literally swings in on a vine and oh. that's his adult Simba's entrance to a uh, to the audience but what do you do though for that first hour and five minutes when you're not on the stage I mean do you have anything to do are you I mean are you literally coming on as a rhino just to, to fill your time or something in the circle of life which opens the production of The Lion King um, I'm one of the wildebeest so I'm fully covered all you can see is probably wool and, uh, I wouldn't put that on your CV to be honest with you Hugh <laughs> I'd leave that off if I were yeah <laughs> But yeah, there's always lots to do, and uh, you know, um, you can either sit in your dressing room or you can be, you know, interactive. You know, I choose to be interactive as part of the production, so yeah, I'm very fortunate. And what about going back? You started as Simba, going back as Mufasa is an obvious step some years later, isn't it? Um, it's a possibility. Uh, I mean, um, Simba, Disney at the moment are uh, of the mind that I'm too old for Simba and too young for Mufasa. So, um, I'm just going to keep working this job <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, for, for as long as I can. Well, I think time will resolve that issue, so there's no problem there. Um, where post, most people probably got to see you was uh, on the X Factor. You did the Tenors of Rock. Was that a good experience for you? Because that's not necessarily a place where talent will do you any good, is it? It's a weird one um, because you, you can be shunned by your peers and uh, working in media, it's very important that you have support of not just your uh your family, your friends, but also the people that you work with. Um, but the rules have changed with uh, Britain's Got Talent and uh, what's called The Voice and X Factor. It's a case now where a lot of the productions are literally inviting professionals to come onto the programme and the tenants of rock, um, which are all founded in theatre, essentially, uh, were invited onto the, onto the programme. And it took us a few weeks to decide, you know, will it um, help us? or would it break our kind of um, our career you know within the band um, so we were quite clever we knew in a sense that the programme would go to use us so we had to find a way to uh, essentially push ourselves forward uh, within the industry and what the X Factor did for the Tennis of Rock was save us a year of touring uh, you know it saved us a year on the road because what it did it gave us a great fan base it let people have a taste of what the Tennis of Rock were about yeah. uh, we had we had our single ready, uh, recorded, mastered. For the day literally we were going to get um, thrown out of the show, we had a whole package ready. So we weren't kind of um, sitting on our laurels. You know, the tennis of rock were very much uh, proactive. And so for us, the act factor was uh, beneficial. I, I'm not speaking out of school, I've said this before. It doesn't sit well with me that programmes like that are asking great people like you to audition. It is meant to be a show where people go and audition if they want to. It's strange, isn't it, that they're in a position now that they can no longer rely on the public, which it was set up for. They're having to come to people like you to sort of feed the show. It, it, what worries me, though, is you're part of that machine. You don't end up winning. Where do you go from there? Fortunately for you, of course, you've got amazing talent it can leave some people stranded, can't it? I think it's, you know, I, I would agree with you. It, it is very difficult. Um, I can't precisely remember, remember the year I should, because I was in it. But um, I did the X Factor by myself in 2006 or seven, um, the same year that uh, Leona Lewis won. Um, but it was a case, because I wasn't with a um, recording company or I wasn't with management, I couldn't go further. So. I'm not, you know, I'm not giving away secrets here. The program, in my view, has always been contrived, yeah. and and so um, people, you know, individuals going into, you know, these televised talent competitions, you know, they really must go in with their eyes open. Every year, we say to ourselves, "Oh, it's a fix. Oh, I'll never watch it again. Oh, you know, um, you know, negative, negative, negative." The next year, we're all sat glued to our TVs watching <laughs> the yeah. same material you know, year after year. So there is something in it that is captivating, but you must go into these 
as you, as you go into life, you know, with eyes wide open. Yeah. And, you know, people are backed by their families and friends. What you see on television, again, is steered to make entertainment, to make it entertaining. If it was, uh, don't get me wrong, a TV program, for example, like the American version of, where, don't get me wrong, and I could be speaking out of place here, but I feel with the American version, a took 90% of the talent is broad reaching. It's not just one genre of music. It's different genres competing. Rather than in the UK, they seem to go for whatever's in at that moment in time. Yeah. And so you have, um, for example, they're trying to make different people uh, into uh, into the future Mariah Carey or into the future uh, Whitney Houston, uh, rather than allowing them to be themselves. They're always being compared to someone from the past. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think in the states, in my view anyway, they're given uh, a pass on their own merit. Right. I think it's also much less risky if you've got the personality of somebody like Ryland where it doesn't matter. Somebody like you, it does because you've got a career to support. Of course, you paid off. Are the tenors are all still touring? Are you still out there? Yeah, they're, they're going very well. But as you say, it is a huge, huge risk. So as I say, you don't go into um, uh, this and you don't make the decision blindly. It's something that you think, will it work? You know, and we were very lucky that we weren't out at the early stages. Because again, the X Factor, I think it was a the seventh year anniversary or something like that. Uh, people expected something new, expected something different. Yeah. But, but essentially, they got the same X Factor. With the tennis as well, we went out early and um, we, we used the fact that we were on TV, you know, on our website, as seen on TV. That's all we needed to say. We didn't yeah. mention the X Factor. Um, but um, yeah, it is a huge risk. Who was your judge? Basically, we were in Gary Barlow's boot camp. All four judges up on their feet. Uh, Nicole up on the chair, in fact. Uh, that's how much they enjoyed you know, listening to, to what we had from the tennis of rock. Yeah. But you're right, it is a huge, huge gamble. And you can be seen as a product. You know, for, for me, for example, it could have ruined my career. It could have been, oh, you know, that's very cheap what you've done there. And um, I would have had to pretty much start a new vocation yeah and there's no second guess in it there are people with brilliant talent who are ruined aren't they you can't just presume because you're as good as you are you're going to be successful on that show if the producers have a reason for you failing and they do like to turn a success into a flop for ratings um, you, you can't predict it it makes good TV to see somebody good flop um, in the UK we enjoy that we, we build people up to watch them fall um, it's in our psyche for some some odd reason yeah. um, and again that's another side of the industry that you have to be prepared for uh, the rejection so um, I was again very fortunate we went out early and um, you know we captivated our audience got a good fan base and it truly did save the tennis of rock uh, a year on the road yeah well Hugh wish me luck I'm back at Disney auditioning for the warthog role again on Tuesday so we'll <laughs> Wish me all the best for you. Before we do the big plug for the show then that's happening this Sunday at the Leicester Square Theatre, I know you've got an album you're working on. When is that coming out? Uh, that's right. Um, it's uh, my debut album, my debut studio album called Something Inside So Strong, which will be out in the autumn. Very good. Well, listen, come on again for that. Let's do a proper plug and send me a copy of it. I'd love to hear it. You really do have a gift and a beautiful voice. Um, if people want to find out more, your website, your Twitter, your Facebook, if people want to send a carrier pigeon... <laughs> Right, uh, we have um, humaynard.com, also Hugh Maynard at Twitter, and the same uh, official Hugh Maynard on Facebook. Sunday, 17th of August in Leicester Square at the Leicester Square Theatre, Hugh will be singing Bredoy uh, for the Philippine Dream Charity Gala concert to raise funds for abandoned children in Manila. You can see him there and a huge cast of hugely talented people as well. That sounds like fun, something different where you can uh, go and relax and have fun, is it? Definitely, and it's um, interactive as well. So people that are fans of the different shows, different musicals, um, they can meet us um, after the show. Um, it's very much a relaxed atmosphere, uh, it being the Sunday also. And so it's a, a great night to be had. 
I do love how people say in the West End, oh, it's dying, it's not doing well, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Go and see Book of Mormon, see if you can get a seat. Go and see Miss Saigon, see if you can get a seat. Go and see The Lion King, see if you can get a seat on a Saturday matinee. There are amazing shows out there that are doing well, and I think the public will decide. If it's a good show, it will fill, and yours certainly is. Miss Saigon is on at the uh, Prince Edward Theatre. A stunning production, greatest show I've ever seen. A cast that is like no other. And, of course, uh, Hugh Maynard is the big star who comes on in the second half and kills it. Absolutely steals the show with Bradoy. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck on uh, Sunday raising money at the Leicester Square Theatre. Good to talk to you, Hugh. You too, Alex. Thank you.